Rupert, how do you do archaeology on Doggerland? Well, yes, indeed. How do you find out where and how people were living in a landscape that was submerged by a huge tsunami 8,000 years ago (laughs) and now lies under 300 feet of water at the bottom of the North Sea with virtually zero visibility? Uh, It's a really good question, isn't it? It's a very good question. (laughs) Yeah. So, look, as luck would have it, we know a man who does know how. In fact, Professor Vince Gaffney is the guy, I mean, actually the guy responsible for a lot of what we know about Doggerland. What's more, a little while ago, we were lucky enough to get him onto a Zoom call for a chat. Yes, uh, taken from a much longer Prehistory Guys interview, uh, link is above and in the description, this sequence is when Vince told us all about how our understanding of Doggerland's past began to unfold. He did indeed. And all I said was, tell us about Doggerland. Well, Doggerland's an interesting one because um, it, it is one of the things that you can actually say sprang from a master's a master's um, set of lectures, because I used to do a a session on landscapes you can't do anything with in in, Uh Birmingham, in the master's landscape course. And um, one of them always was um, the lands underneath the North Sea becoming known or popularised as Doggerland by Brian, Brian Nichols. Um, and, you know, right in the middle of it is this the, the so-called Le Mananua Point, which is dragged up in the 30s. Mm. Um, right? Sorry, the Clinda Point, sorry. Yeah. Um, um, for, on the Le Mananua Banks in the 30s by the, by, um, the, the, tra- the trawler, the Kalinda, um, um with Pilgrim E. Lockwood, the wonderfully named skipper of the boat, um, <laughs> and back in the 30s, which, you know, you know, was was picked up by Graham Clark and went to um, um, uh, the, you know, was well known in the, in, the, in the literature as being the evidence for this this area being being populated rather than just a stretch of sea. We're talking um, about the harpoon we, here, aren't we? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Yes, it's, a, it's probably from a fish spear or something like that, actually. Mm-hmm. There have been a bundle of these things tied together to, 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 to get fish. Some, or eels or whatever. Um, it, you know, but it, it's, you, you know, we've known that there was a landscape out there for, yeah. you know, certainly since the beginning of the, 20, the, the 20th century. Um, Clement Reed, the great um, geologist, botanist, had put this forward in his his, his book on, on 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 prehistoric fossil forests in the area um, around the coastline said there has to be something out there just has to be we just don't know anything about it and it might be about the period of um, of the the pyramids so we might find a scarab or so and then date you know? I mean, there was no unfair to him it's not dating events to go on at the time but um but you know, we 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 did this, and we had a, there's a, a a one of the master's students, um, a guy called Simon Fitch, um, said who would come from a geology course. Yeah, he said, you know, well, what about oil and gas data? And we sat down, we had a talk, and we said, yeah, what about oil and gas data? All we need is someone who can who who knows what oil and gas data looks like, and um, and um, and who can also introduce us to people in the oil and gas um, sector to, to perhaps help us. And there was a guy called Ken Thompson, who had previously, as it turned out, taught Simon. And um, so we went along to see him. And um, and and he, and he, he said, well, yeah, why not? Well, let's have a go. And it was only um, sometime later when he, when he'd, um, when, 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 that he admitted that he'd misunderstood what we'd asked him. Because if he had, he'd have told us to go away. Because, <laughs> because, because he'd, he'd presumed that we were talking about the Paleolithic and the deeper sectors of, uh, of, oh, right. of habitable areas. Because at that point in time, um, the seismic columns, which we were we were talking about, the, the, the big geophysical surveys done by large boats using, you know, some sonic sources, which are mm-hmm. collected mm-hmm. rather like um, radar data. Um, 
um, uh, the the top of the column, the water column, and, and the the the, the seabed face generally was never it couldn't be interpreted uh, for a variety of reasons, but th- that was decided as a fact in the sixties, really. Mm. Um, and no one had really gone back and said, well, computing has gone on a bit and visualization of this data has improved. Yeah. And it was a, it had become a factoid that mm. you couldn't look at the point we were interested in, which mm. was not that far below the surface of the, of the seabed, yeah, yeah, down yeah. to about 16 meters. Most and what, is, what is it about your studies? What's um, come out of your data, of the oil and gas well, data that well, you've used that's been able to inform your thoughts about? You know how well, the well, dog land was populated was, and all that. Yeah. Yes. Well, the the, the first well, initially not nothing. And I'll say that <laughs> because because initially we thought we we'll be able to get the um the, the, if we can get anything about top, topography then we're on onto it. We got the data. The 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 oil and gas companies didn't throw us out because Ke- they knew Ken Thompson. The basin geomorphologist we work on is the only way, reason we got to the door, never mind through it. Um, and um, they said, yeah, we, we know him. We, we don't know you, but we'll, we'll only give you a small bit of data to, to work on. And they said, and we won't give you any more than 6,000 square kilometres. <laughs> <laughs> no more. And, uh, and he, the... the um, they, and they, because I went back and literally within a, a week, we've got the first river on the top oh, of the Dogger Bank. I mean, yeah. honestly, you know, it, we've got the image of it, that first river. We mm. relate and named it the Shotton River after the great geologist by the river and all that stuff. From oh, there. really? Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, um, and at that point, we knew we could, we could start generating real maps of a prehistoric landscape that we had never seen before and was probably very well preserved, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. The first, we did the first project on 25,000 square kilometres, about the size of Wales, wow. in 18 months and got it pretty much to publication. In That's amazing. amazing. It was, it yeah. was, it was stunning. Yeah. We, 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 but we only had... Um, a map. It was a. It was an ordnance survey map. There was hundreds of rivers, lakes, hills, without any people in, yeah. and without any prospect of people. But oh. what we had always planned was, if we could <laughs> find the rivers, if we could find the streams, if we could, we had the clue to the sediment caches. We could go and find data in. Mm. It was always planned. Always what planned. What kind of data? Get... What what kind of data, Vince? Can the you find was, in the sediments? The data was going to be initially be paleoenvironmental data because if you've got the shape of the land, and here I'm an arche- uh, landscape archaeologist. If you can clothe it with with with, um, with 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 environmental data, you will be able to find the areas that are most likely to be inhabited, or or where or where con- activities concentrate to the extent that you are likely to be able to find um, evidence of human populations, and it will be so easy. That was yeah. the plan. Well, it took us <laughs> quite a lot. You know, we we finished a, um, the second. Well, we did a number of phases. Uh, NOAA, the American um, National o- Oceanographic and Atmospheric um, um, Administration, gave us money to do the eastern sector. So, you know, we, we, we I can't remember, we had about 40,000 kilometres of landscape at that point. Um, <laughs> and and we, it took us a while after that until we, we, we could, we could, we could, do do something do some do something else. Now in the interim, I'd started talking um, to uh, geneticists at, at Birmingham um, about the possibility of using sedimentary DNA to give um, to look directly at sediments along with traditional um, paleoenvironmental data in order to get 
to to get a better insight. Uh, it was uncertain we'd be able to use that, but we did a pilot project at Golden Cliff, Britain's only um, submerged um, Mesolithic site, oh. and we got this this I admit contentious um, 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 product which actually had weed in yeah. at six thousand BC which is not meant to be there, clearly. But we can't, <laughs> you know, we can't, we can't, we have not been able to falsify that, that data. Anyway, I mean, okay. it, it's, it's, it's deeply buried. It's beneath 10 to 15 kilometres of, of marine sediment. It's mm. on a rise be, above Paleo Channel, so yeah, yeah. sheet wash might, I suppose, be, be something, but it didn't look like it. But it showed, <laughs> the one thing it showed, one thing it showed, whether you liked it or whether you agreed with that or not, was that DNA was being preserved at an early date. And yeah. if you were able yeah. to get the caches of, de- of, of, of sediment, and that which had been preserved rapidly, and that's what transgression does, does you should be able to apply this. At this point, I was working with Robin Alby in, in Warwick University. We then had all the pieces in place to do something much bigger. Yeah. And in 2015, we were lucky enough to be given a European advanced grant, one of these blue sky grants, two and a half million. Wow. Um, and we, that gave us the option of pulling together a major team of paleoenvironmentalists, seismologists, computer modelers to work together on reconstructing the landscape in a big way. We had the money to send ships out to sea and to collect a uh, hundred odd cores going down the valleys that we knew about because the valleys are time machines. The further down you go, the older they are and they're being inundated so they're being sealed. Yeah. So yeah, we've yeah. got... We Vince, have I'm, I, I'm very conscious of, uh, yeah. of the, the time yeah. romping on because yeah. we could it's genuinely talk about Doggerland on its own. We could talk yeah. about... Or sedimentary hours. DNA. Who knew? Or indeed <laughs> sedimentary <laughs> DNA. And, yeah. Well, um, I, but, I mean, if, um, we just, if we just stop and say, yeah. the, the, it's working. Yeah. The first thing is... Um, at an environmental level, we appear to have got a, uh, one, the Storega tsunami deposit the furthest south we've ever come across. That's just been published. And mm, more yeah. importantly, was we went prospecting for flint in our lithics or artifacts in the areas that we believe they would be they would be most likely found. And we have got we've got lithics from the, wow. the seabed. Yes, yeah, that's yes. taken fifteen years to get to that point. Mm, I mean, it has yes. been a long, and it was planned, mm, mm, as long as we got yes. money. Sure, sure. I just, I think the whole, the whole thing about you know revelations from Doggerland, it's just the gift that keeps on giving, isn't it? The <laughs> the information that will keep continue to come from that yeah. is uh, extraordinary, really. Um, but coming back to the Stonehenge landscape and. Uh,